All right, now that we've got the theory out of the way, let's do a quick practical demonstration, call it a day. For demonstration purposes, I'm gonna make use of a two pole pair per phase, 200 watt synchronous machine with Y configured windings designed to operate using light industrial, 120 volt line to neutral, 208 volt line to line, 60 hertz, three phase AC. In this scenario, the stator is isolated and unloaded, meaning the stator windings are de-energized and not supplying current to any electrical load. All we have is an external DC power supply and some external prime mover. The prime mover can be moving wind, falling water, expanding steam, or an internal combustion engine. But in this lab setting, I'm using a computer controlled drive dynamometer. The idea is to start turning the rotor with the prime mover with varying amounts of DC excitation to the field and observe the result and output on the stator windings. Ideally, we should be able to confirm several properties. One, prime mover rotational direction influences phase sequence. Two, Field current magnitude influences voltage magnitude. And lastly, three, prime mover rotational speed influences both induced voltage frequency and magnitude. An oscilloscope set up to simultaneously display the three line of neutral output voltages. V1 in black, V2 in red, and V3 in blue shows no output voltage when the rotor is at rest and field excitation current is at zero amps DC. One might expect that. The prime mover isn't turning the rotor, nor is there an electromagnet on the rotor. Let's put this thing to work. When an external prime mover starts turning the rotor at 1,500 RPM and no field excitation current, we observe something that might at first seem unexpected. You gotta look close, but the stator windings are experiencing a tiny, tiny amount of AC voltage on the order of 2.4 volts RMS, even though there is no electromagnet on the rotor. Why is this happening? The answer is something known as residual magnetism which is a tendency for ferromagnetic materials, i.e. iron, to retain a little bit of magnetism after a magnetic field has been applied and then removed. You may have observed this phenomenon in your everyday experience with a magnetic screwdriver briefly magnetizing the screw only for that screw to remain magnetic, at least temporarily, after the magnetic bit is removed. That's what's happened to the rotor. Somebody must have excited this rotor some time ago and a tiny, tiny amount of residual magnetism remains. Before we excite this rotor and move on to the rest of this demonstration, I do want to discuss how we can put this residual magnetism phenomenon to use. For the purposes of this lecture series, I've discussed the exciter as if it was a separate external DC source like a battery or some adjustable DC power supply, which it often is. Other types of exciters exist. For example, you could use an external prime mover to start turning an unexcited rotor exhibiting a small amount of residual magnetism such that a small AC voltage appears in the stator windings, like we're observing right now. That small AC voltage on the stator could then be stepped up using a transformer and then fed to a power electronics device known as a rectifier that changes AC to DC. This DC electricity could then be fed back to the rotor to create a more powerful electromagnet on the rotor such that more AC voltage appears in the stator and this increased AC output is again transformed, rectified, and fed back to the rotor, which creates a more powerful electromagnet, which creates more AC voltage on the stator, and on and on and on in a positive reinforcement fashion. For obvious reasons, this is known as self-excitation. Essential to self-excited generators is that tiny seed of residual magnetism that essentially jumpstarts the whole process. The obvious problem with self-excitation is, what happens if there is no residual magnetism to begin with? As you're no doubt aware, residual magnetism is temporary in nature and fades not only with time, but also heat and impact. The longer you wait, the hotter it gets, and the more you shake it, the weaker the residual magnetism gets to a point it essentially disappears. This wouldn't be an ideal scenario for some mission-critical generator. For this reason, there often exists an external battery backup that can be used to briefly excite the rotor at the start, and then when sufficient electromagnetism on the rotor exists, the self-excitation process can take over. This is sometimes referred to as flashing the field, i.e. jump-starting a self-excited generator with an external DC source. We'll examine self-excited generators and the power electronics devices like rectifiers that make them possible in greater detail in later lectures. Returning to the topic of this lecture, electrically excited synchronous generators, let's keep the prime mover turning at 1,500 RPM and crank up the DC field current to 100 milliampers. The induced voltage magnitude jumps to 22.7 volts and appears to have a frequency of 50 hertz. We increased field current and voltage and voltage only went up. 
when we keep the prime mover turning at 1,500 RPM and crank up the DC field excitation current to 160 milliampers, the induced voltage magnitude again jumps up, this time to 37.4 volts, and frequency remains at 50 Hz. Again, we increased field current, and again, voltage went up. Thus far, induced voltage magnitude does indeed seem to increase as we increase field current. Now, let's keep the DC field excitation current at 160 milliampers and increase the prime mover speed to 1800 RPM. Something interesting happens. Not only does frequency increase to 60 Hz, but also induced voltage magnitude jumps to 45 volts. Interesting indeed. Prime mover rotational speed appears to influence both induced voltage magnitude and frequency. Thus far, the prime mover has been turning this rotor in the clockwise direction. For all these samples, we have observed a sequence of V1, V2, V3 with a relative phase shift 120 degrees between phases. Let's try this in reverse. When we start spinning the prime mover at negative 1800 RPM or 1800 RPM counterclockwise and keep field current at the previous level 160 milliampers, we still observe 45 volt output at 60 Hz, however phase sequence is flip flopped. Note the oscope tray shows a reverse sequence of V1, V3, V2, still with a relative phase shift of 120 degrees between phases. This demonstrates prime mover rotational direction influences phase sequence. In this short demonstration, we've confirmed several important properties, notably prime mover rotational direction influences phase sequence, field current magnitude influences induced voltage magnitude, and lastly, prime mover rotational speed influences both induced voltage frequency and magnitude. In ordinary circumstances, we call it a day, but I just cannot resist in messing with this setup a little bit more. Let's say we're trying to establish light industrial, 120 volts, line to neutral, 208 volt line to line, 60 hertz, three phase AC with a one, two, three phase sequence. We're almost there. Let's take it all the way. Let's return prime mover rotational direction back to clockwise so we get a desired one, two, three phase sequence. Let's keep it rotating at 1800 RPM since this was giving us our desired 60 hertz output. At 160 milliamp your field current, we again observe 45 volts. This is well shy of our 120 volt line to neutral goal. What to do? We got two options, increase field current or increase the speed. What would you do? If you said increase speed, you are wrong. Yes, increasing speed would increase voltage magnitude, however, it would also increase frequency. We're already at the desired 60 Hertz, so it's in our best interest to keep speed at 1800 RPM and just vary field current since it influences voltage magnitude only. At an increased 210 milliampers of field current, voltage magnitude rises to 57 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. When I step field current up to 350 milliampers, voltage magnitude rises to 85 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. At 410 milliampers of field current, voltage magnitude rises to 98 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. When I step up field current to 585 milliampers, voltage magnitude rises to 116 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. So close, just a little more field current. Way too much. At 720 milliampers of field current, voltage magnitude rises to 127 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. We've overshot our desired voltage magnitude. Let's dial field current back a bit. At a reduced 634 milliampers of field current, voltage magnitude drops back to our desired 120 volts and frequency remains 60 Hertz. Phase sequence, phase shift, frequency, and voltage magnitude are exactly what we want. Perfect. Am I right? Not really. Keep in mind, for the purposes of this demonstration, this generator is isolated and not supplying any electrical load. It's just sitting there looking pretty, but really not doing any work. If you think about it, this generator is not only not connected to some larger grid, it's not even connected to any loads in any isolated grid. An analogy might be installing and setting up the first generator on some small island community with no other generators. Before you start supplying electricity to any of the grass huts, coconut farms, and fish processing facilities on this island, it's probably a good idea to establish a desired phase sequence, phase shift, frequency, and magnitude before doing so. We'll examine in an upcoming lecture how actually connecting to an electrical load and how varying the magnitude and nature of that electrical load can influence the generator's output and how an operator can compensate for these changing demands. Until then, this concludes this lecture. In conclusion, we examine electrically excited synchronous generators in the unloaded condition. We learned that the physical construction of the prime mover influences phase shift, 
rotational direction, the prime mover influences phase sequence, field current strength influences voltage magnitude, and prime mover rotational speed influences both frequency and voltage magnitude. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.